Hey, Kristen here. Welcome to Pullback. Trying to be a good person can be overwhelming in our complex global marketplace. In this podcast, we try to make it a little easier by looking at the details behind consumer movements, product labels, and ethical lifestyles. Each episode, we challenge ourselves to try something new in ethical consumption. Then we tell you what we learn, fuck-ups and all. So happy Valentine's Day. To introduce this episode, I've written you all a little poem. Roses are red. Violets are blue. Sugar is sweet. But also, holy shit, it's fucked up, too. In this episode of Pullback, Kyla and I are digging into the topic of sugar. Sugar has such a complicated history. And that history is essential to understanding how the sugar industry works today. So... We brought in an expert to help contextualize Sugar's past and its present. For this episode, Kyla and I are joined by Alexandra Sundersing, who is an historian of food, migration, and labor. Lex is working on her PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Kyla and I both learned a lot from this conversation that we had with Lex, and I think that you will too. In this episode, you'll hear our conversation with Lex about sugar, and as a bonus, we'll also be releasing a shorter episode on Thursday where we talk to Lex about the history of food. That's definitely a must listen. We cover the history of food trucks, restaurants, gastro diplomacy, and even pad thai robots. So you'll definitely want to tune in Thursday to find out what those are. All right, on with the podcast. I don't know a lot about the history of sugar production, but from what I've heard, it's like one of those industries that is really heavily tied to slavery and various human rights abuses. And I mean, I for this episode, I've looked a little bit into the present day and spoiler alert, it hasn't changed all that much. But I don't, I don't know if you could tell us a little bit more about the history of sugar if you... Yeah. yeah. Um, so I haven't read it in a while. I Actually, I'll probably be revisiting it over the break, but the most famous and I think like most digestible history of what this industry is like is Sidney Mintz's Sweetness and Power, um, which is, first of all, an amazing title um, and is also very lyrically written. But Mintz was an anthropologist of the Caribbean, and he's considered one of the sort of like founders of food history because this book is so important to most food historians. Um, It's very lyrical, uh, but it's also very history from the bottom up, which is why I appreciate it. Um, His grounding in actually working with uh, laborers in sugar fields means that that's where his questions all start is in the fields with these workers. And he sort of looks outwards to try and ask why has sugar been so popular forever? Because apparently with notable exception of maybe two or three decades, sugar production and consumption has only ever gone up. Really? So, I mean, and that doesn't surprise me anymore yeah, looking at a modern really North tasty. American diet. <laughs> um, but yeah, so sugar, Mintz is writing about sugar production and he notes a couple of things. Um, one, that it, but yeah, it is super tied to slavery. As a tropical agricultural product, it ends up, I think the plant is originally from New Guinea. Okay. And then it's first processed in India in like the early 1000s or something wow. like that. And then gradually it becomes more and more important and then it becomes a commodity crop during the like age of high imperialism and it especially becomes prominent across what end up being British colonies. And so it is very tied to slavery, especially because it is very tied to the Caribbean and, um, and Brazil. And so, um, it's a crop where people are in like a lot of danger all the time where they're working with it. It requires harvesting with dangerous implements, like people are using machetes or cutlasses to harvest it. Um, and then it has to be ground and it has to be boiled. And so this is a crop where it's like, there are sharp things and fiery things and heavy things. And that's the stuff. Um, and then sugar cane fields themselves are really dangerous. Some of the kinds of sugar cane that exist can be like 15 feet tall mm. when they're ready to harvest. And that means you're functionally hacking a jungle down every time you harvest a sugar crop. And that means there are like snakes and who knows what else. Oh, I never in thought the about fields. that. Yeah. Yeah. And so it ends up vastly modifying the landscape in the places where it's harvested and then being really dangerous to harvest the whole time. Um, and that means that 
colonial overseers are not really interested in harvesting it themselves, and they're interested in people they don't consider people doing this work because they consider them expendable. And so it doesn't matter if they get bit by a snake or if they like are overworked and work an 18 hour day and then have to wake up the next day and do it again, because they're probably not going to pay them and they're fine with them being in danger. Yeah. Spoiler alert. That is still true. Um, (laughs) Yes. (laughs) But, but yeah, so sugar mince goes through that portion of explaining that the danger of harvesting sugar while it's not readily apparent is connected to why so many people of color end up harvesting sugar. And then um, Mintz also connects this to the rise of industrial capitalism in Europe and looks at the demand side of things and Mm. is like, if you're a poor laborer and you can't really afford food and it's like, I don't know, 1820 and you're hungry, sugar is a really calorie efficient fuel that will dull your hunger a little bit and sort of power you through. And so he connects not just the rise of tea and coffee, both of which he's like, they're much better if you put sugar in them. And then workers, especially he uses England as a case study. Like if you have afternoon tea, he connects that as an institution, not to like fancy afternoon tea at hotels, but to people coming home and they're like, okay, I can afford a piece of bread and some sort of something before I go back out to work. And that something ends up being tea or coffee with sugar in it. Um, And then he tracks that and is like, okay, well, once it's incorporated in your diet that way, then things like jams and preserves and then cakes and then candy bars. And then all of those things become popular as really like high calorie, but small things. And so that imbricates the story of sugar with the story of chocolate and the story of all the other sort of like tasty treats that are growing all in colonial spaces. And they're all tropical crops. Yeah. So yeah, I guess the history of sugar is, like, it has its own history, but it that history is impossibly connected to, like, you can't separate it out from all the things we put sugar into. In I imagine if we wrote a history of corn now, yeah. that the, like, modern history of corn would do the same thing. That's so interesting, because I, I had read a little bit about sort of, like, the very quick ascendancy of sugar, um, which already sort of made me think, it's so ubiquitous now that I had kind of imagined it was something that, like all societies were using for a very long time. Um, but in my sort of imagination of it, I imagined it sort of being something that the elite primarily consumed and then sort of with like the mass consumption movement, it um, got went to everybody. But from what you're saying is almost sort of the opposite, that it was this kind of like relatively cheap additive that you could put into food if you can't afford a lot. It starts out being an elite thing, but I think the elite period of sugar is much earlier than I expected it to be. So really? like... If you think about the sort of like Tudor era or medieval and Renaissance periods, um, all of those sort of like weird decorative cakes where it's like, aha, it's a cake, but it's also a pheasant. Um, (laughs) Those are all covered in sugar in like a gross way that I don't want at dinner. Sure. (laughs) Um, And that is the period at which sugar is so expensive that only the elites are eating it. And then when you get towards sort of the industrial era, Sugar is still expensive, and so you can't have a lot of it, but it is cheap enough that it can be like a sort of high calorie addition to people's diets who are poor. And it's cheaper when you're triaging than buying other whole foods. So maybe it's not cheap, but you can afford more sugar than you can apples and peaches and bread and, and the labor of putting sugar into something that's already made is easier. So whether or not it's available to everyone, it ends up being um, a cost effective addition or substitute for things that otherwise would take you a lot of labor to eat. And so, yeah, I was really surprised to find that sugar's history is much more, much more involved with mass consumption earlier than I thought it would be. Like, it's like by the time the 1800s are rolling around, Europeans are just eating more and more and more sugar. Um, Mintz has some like really fantastic statistics where like by I think it's by like the early 1900s the like average per person consumption is something crazy like 40 grams wow where it's like wow like at this period of time I wouldn't have expected that yeah I actually don't know how much sugar we consume in a day I just assume it's way too much (laughs) I'm I'm pretty sure that it's more than 50 grams now on average in, in America. Yeah, it's got to be. Um, 
I mean, it's in everything. Yes. <laughs> So I just Googled average sugar intake Canada, and the top result is from sugar.ca. So I don't know how trustworthy a source that is, but according this to dietary like intake... one, two, three, or whatever. <laughs> Surprisingly authentic. According to, according to dietary intake surveys from the Canadian Community Health Survey, or CCHS 2015, consumption of total sugars in Canada was 101 grams for children aged 2 to 8, 115 grams for children aged 9 to 18, and 85 grams for adults, which demonstrates a reduction of 3, 13, and 8 grams, respectively, compared to 2004. So that sounds like a lot. Yes. Yeah, it's <laughs> doubled or tripled, depending on the age group. I'm just going to double check one more source, because that sounds like a lot. Give me one second. I would not be surprised. People <laughs> drink half of their calories now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, and you know what? For this, ch so we were, we're going to, I think we're going to talk about challenges that we did, but I wasn't even sure that I would be able to be on this recording. So like five days ago, I, I panicked <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'll just stop eating sugar for the next five days. No problem. Except that I went to Subway twice. And so I looked up how much sugar is in like Subway bread, my bread of choice, and how much is in my sauce of choice. And just from a foot-long Subway sandwich, I was consuming like almost, I think, 30 grams of sugar. So that wow. was cool. Not to call out Subway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Subway, my steady friend. <laughs> uh, so I'm just on uh, globalnews.ca and they, they give an example, like a tablespoon of ketchup, for example, has uh, a teaspoon worth of sugar in it. And a can Whoa. of baked beans can have as much as 14 teaspoons of sugar. So it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the things that people forget about sugar is that it's a preservative. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I, I think about this the most when I think about Christmas candy, you know, those, like, strange little jellies, and they're, like, coated in, like, very crystalline sugar on the outside. Well, it's like, yeah, those are a super old form of candy, and they're made that way because it, like, you know, when you don't have pectin and you're making jellied things, well, how do you preserve it? You put a bunch of sugar in it. Sure. And so jam works that way, too. Um, you can make jam that has a pretty okay shelf life with no pectin in it, but it's got, like, a buttload of sugar. <laughs> so I'll definitely post some information about what our sugar intake is, but it's really, it looks like it's kind of hard to find out the answer. So I think the answer that I gave originally is going to be as close as we get. And yeah, if you want, Kristen, we can move on to the challenges now. I think you did some interesting stuff. Well, I, let's maybe start with you because you, you sort of talked a little bit about it already. I mean, I basically talked about the whole thing, I think. <laughs> I, I tried okay. not to have sugar at all for five days. I'm going to keep it going. I want to do a solid uh, two weeks to make the challenge feel like it was, um, you know, authentic. And then I'll post about it afterwards because obviously I just didn't have time. But yeah, basically I was trying not to eat sugar and then I went to Subway and I ended up having heaps of sugar. And even with just that Going on, I still feel like I may be going through a bit of sugar withdrawal. I had to have a teaspoon of honey the other day because I was just having such bad cravings. <laughs> so I'm just imagining you like shaking and like getting the honey. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's not far off because I don't drink coffee. I I I have a lot of tea uh, for my caffeine intake, but when I'm really tired and I'm struggling, which this December, which is when we're recording this episode, which is, I imagine, why Lex is back in Toronto with you, visiting her family, maybe. Yep. So this month <laughs> in particular, I've been really busy. And when I get really busy and I'm tired and I don't have time to make proper food, sometimes instead of what a normal person would do would like have extra coffee, what I'll do is I'll just like up my sugar intake to keep myself going. And so, yeah, I feel like maybe cutting it out uh was <laughs> that's very industrial era factory worker of you. <laughs> very dickensian yeah so <laughs> so that's that's kind of what i've been doing and i am feeling the pinch <laughs> but Kristen's 
Kristen's challenge this week was a lot more interesting than mine. So you sent me a picture of what you <laughs> she made. Says without knowing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It looked really good. You sent me a photo. Oh, yeah, yeah. This was, um, I'll partially, I decided to make something with fair trade sugar, which doubles as a thank you for interviewing with us. Uh, oh, yeah. thank, thank you. Thank you for being on the podcast. So I started my challenge by basically just looking at all of the processed food items that I have in my fridge or pantry. And I was actually surprised there wasn't as many items that had processed sugar as I would have thought. But yeah, I did have the gelato <laughs> that was originally in that container um, had sugar in it, of course. And then there were some sugar in in these like veggie pot stickers that I eat. And I did not expect that, but probably should have. Uh, and then strawberry jam, of course. And then a few, just a few sauces, basically, was the other stuff. And uh, essentially, the, the only one that was certified for anything at all was an organic seal. Otherwise, nothing. It was just regular sugar. And so, I mean, we'll talk about labor in the sugar industry, but almost certainly that means at, in the best case, poverty level wages, and in the worst case, just straight out like slavery and child labor. So it's not great. So, so I also tried to do sort of like a lighter version of what Kyla was doing. I was just trying not to buy anything like snacks and things like that, that had sugar. I did not look into like actual restaurant foods or anything like that, even though I'm sure they all have sugar in them. Um, but I found it like, it's actually really hard to find fair trade certified sugar um, items. I went through like a, a sort of convenience store here and found not a single thing. And then eventually I went to like the, there's like a, a local organic grocery store called Big Carrot in Toronto. So I went there and I was like, surely they'll have fair trade and they, they did. They had one item um, or one sort of brand that had a bunch of chocolate bark items that were all fair trade. So do fair trade certified items have to have all the ingredients be fair trade or is it just no. the dominant thing? So, I mean, we're going to have to do a whole episode on fair trade because it was very complicated. But um, so, yeah, fair trade, there's um, there's sort of two different buckets so you can have fair trade certified, which means that there are certain standards that a company would need to adhere to for either the product or the supply chain. And then that gets sort of verified by a third party. And then there's fair trade member. And that essentially just means that you have like small producers or retailers or whatever that pay into a membership for a fair trade organization. And so they do have to adhere to the values in order to be members, but there's not sort of like that audit process. So like could be a little bit less rigorous, I suppose. Um, although I will say, so in the Christmas episode that we'll have released by the time this podcast comes out, uh, we talk about uh, 10,000 Villages. It's a fair trade shop in Canada. And it is a member fair trade organization. So they have a few items that are fair trade certified, but most of the stuff is, is just with companies that are fair trade membership. But I think the idea is that you're part of a movement and that that trust is built in that way. So you may not necessarily need the certification process. But to answer your question more directly, um, a lot of the times it'll just be one ingredient that is fair trade certified or a few. The, product that I ended up buying, it had basically everything except for the salt was organic. And then there were, I think the chocolate, let me so see if I can So what Kristen it. is describing, I believe, is chocolate peppermint bark. Is that what you ended up buying? No, it's, um, so it's a chocolate hazelnut and crispy rice bark. I thought you made it from scratch and I'm really disappointed now. No, no, this is a different... I also made made a thing with fair trade sugar. Yes, sweet. Okay, sorry. Sorry for doubting you. <laughs> That's what that is. Um, <laughs> is the thing I made. Um, you, you actually... I, I didn't particularly like this chocolate bark, so... <laughs> it's, this is very good, what I made for you, but the, the bark that I bought, I don't love. So I won't say the brand, because I didn't like it that much. But they had, um, yeah, like chocolate, cocoa butter, cane sugar, and vanilla. Those were all fair trade. 
And then almost everything was organic. And that was that. And you were saying that it's really hard to just to buy anything really like you you can only get one or two items is it because sugar is just so ubiquitous that nobody cares and nobody's shopping for it or like why why is it that all of our sugar is evil and we don't have a lot of options (laughs) well i think it actually is more about fair trade um i mean there's probably a little bit of both that like you need you need sugar to be cheap i think and yeah but uh, on the other hand, there just isn't a lot of fair trade. It's one of the hardest to find labels when you're like looking in a grocery store, at least from my personal experience. Unless you're looking for like coffee or tea where there tends to be a lot. So is there is the only way to not be evil when consuming sugar? Is, is it just to not consume sugar? Well, in my <laughs> experience, one of the things that happened as I learned about the history of sugar is... Um, so actually my introduction to sugar truly is a testament to the fact that you should follow your gut instinct and then you would start your graduate degree like 1500 years sooner with the topic (laughs) that you were going to end up with anyway. Um, because when I was in my freshman year of undergrad, I was in a geography course. Yeah. At, um, the university of Toronto called food environments and people. And our end of semester project was you had to pick a food item and try and follow its like geographic chain talking about the labor conditions along the way. Mm -hmm. And I was like, cool, I'll do sugar. um, Cause there's tons of writing about sugar and this will be fine. And the actual truth of the matter was that it was not fine. And I couldn't find anything um, because it's obscured. And I thought that the solution when I found out about the terrible labor history in tropical sugar would be to start eating sugar made from sugar beets. And I was like, great, Canada, we have labor laws. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> but then <laughs> I know what you found. <laughs> I couldn't find which sugar was sugar beets mm. and which sugar was sugar cane. Oh, there is a trick for Canada. I found that out. Although We'll talk about sugar beet production and its history in Canada. <laughs> but um, if you buy Rogers sugar that has a black stamp that says 22 at the beginning, that is Alberta grown sugar beet. And like huh. 80% of Canada's sugar beet production is just from Alberta. There's another 20% that's grown in Ontario, but that all goes to Michigan where it gets refined there. It's all to do with trade laws. Like, um, there are high tariffs on, I think, on both sides for um, importing refined sugar. But if you're exporting sugar beets, the tariffs aren't high. So it's like you can grow sugar beets and export them as a Canadian producer, and that's fine. Um, but if you were trying to export sugar, like, it just wouldn't happen. Huh. Yeah. I didn't even know about that and didn't know there was a brand. And so when I did this mm-hmm. project, I guess, seven or eight years ago, I was like, let's find out what's in red path sugar. Yeah. And then the answer was, they will not let you find out where their <laughs> sugar is from. Um, it's from a bunch of places. And all of this, all of this was just because I grew up uh, having seen the red path sugar factory on the yeah. harbor front and having gone there because I like, you know, my aunt and uncle would take us and there's the cool grocery store that's now a fancy Loblaws. And they're like, we'll go to the fancy Loblaws and we'll go walk on the harbor front. And there's all these nice things. And now even I, like my cousin who, it used to be me and my aunt and my uncle and my cousin who would go on most of these outings. And like, she now lives in a apartment with a view of the Red Path Sugar Factory. And she sees the boats emptying and unloading like tankers worth of yeah. sugar. And it's all sugar cane, like, um, at at least from my, I think, because there's only one sugar beet processing facility, because I guess the processing process, the process is different, slightly different. Uh, Sugar beets um, are slightly, slightly different from sugar cane chemically, which means that they only need to sort of be processed once, um, which also means you can't really produce brown sugar from it, which I think is kind of interesting. But um, so you have to have different refineries for them. And there's just one refinery for sugar beets in Canada, and it's in Tabor, Alberta. And then there are three refineries, 
maybe more because I think there's one in Belleville too, but they're basically one or two in Ontario. Then there's one in Montreal and there's one in Vancouver and they're all sugar cane other than the one in Alberta. And I assume they're all in deep water ports. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, we can't grow sugar cane. (laughs) Yeah. Um, As a plug for anyone who's super invested in seeing the inner workings of this whole sugar story and also is in or lives in the Toronto area, um, I discovered it at the Doors Wide Open Festival in May, but certainly at Doors Wide Open, Red Path opens the big, like, room, storehouse, I don't know what to call it, (laughs) where all the sugar is, Mm. and you can, like, go into that room, and it's like a football field long, big warehouse looking building that is full floor to ceiling with like mounds of sugar. And that's like literally just being dumped out of the boats into that building. And it gets scooped up by like things that I associate with doing construction, like whatever those little scooper vehicles are. And like, I was like, why there's a backhoe digging piles of sugar (laughs) and putting it in trucks Um, But they also... I feel like that's every child's dream, right? (laughs) It's gotta be. And then year round, there is the Red Path Sugar Museum, which like has a bunch of very euphemistic captions and pictures of (laughs) sugar barons. And you can go and they're like, the workers. I'm like, oh, I think you mean slaves. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So maybe it's now it's time to talk about the baggage that I found with Canadian sugar beets. Because I thought, you know... Sugar beets. That seems kind of nice. <laughs> I saw this I saw this how it's made video and it was like this British farmer, it was all mechanized. It was like this is great. It doesn't seem like it's going to have a lot of labor abuses. The factory seems really efficient. Bad. I was not <laughs> I was not correct. Um, and actually it may be the case that like labor Today in the sugar beet industry in Canada, I suspect it's relatively good because it is mostly mechanized, but that was sort of like a recent development. So in the history of Canadian sugar beet production, there are two massive shames. Uh, The first one is Japanese internment. Oh. Yeah. So for those that may not know about this, during World War II, about 12,000 Canadian, Japanese Canadians were sent to work um, to internment camps or to work in various places. Um, And one of the places that they ended up going was to sugar beet farms in Alberta and Manitoba. Yeah. So basically at the time, there aren't these big machines. So harvesting sugar beets is actually pretty labor intensive. And so um, about 4,000 ended up going there. And... uh, It's just really terrible working conditions. And, uh, you know, of course, these people are sort of displaced from mostly living in British Columbia. So so they they're sort of moved all their properties gone and they end up working long hours for a little pay on these sugar beet farms. Um, So I wasn't specifically able to find the link, but Rogers Sugar on their website talks about how they got involved in beet sugar processing in Alberta in the 30s. So I have to imagine, because we don't have, we've never had that many sugar refineries. So I have to imagine that Rogers then is processing sugar that is coming from interned Japanese Canadians. So that's bad. The second one that we might also have expected is that Canadian sugar beets were farmed by basically bonded labor from indigenous people. And this was like way more recent than I would have thought, you know, it only ended in the 1980s, basically. Yeah, it's not great. Oh, what? Well, how, how did they get into the bonded labor? So essentially, it so is um, northern Métis communities on the prairies. And so they're living on reserves and in a lot of cases didn't have sort of a lot of employment opportunity opportunities. So basically they'd be recruited by farmers to help out with the harvest in the summer. And uh, the Department of Indian Affairs was basically helping these farmers to like coerce people 
because they'd cut um, individuals off of social assistance if they wouldn't go down to be on these farms. Um, and they also would take children away. Uh, so people that don't have a lot of employment prospects, need money, sort of really depend on social assistance, are then being pushed by the government to go work on these farms, um, farming sugar beets, and to bring their children with them. And if they don't go, then the Department of Indian Affairs takes their children away. And if they do go, sometimes the Department of Indian Affairs takes their children away. So, uh, yeah, shit's fun. And then um, is that, so I assume the kids were being sent to residential schools in that case. Yeah, so I was thinking about this because, like, residential school's not shut down yet. And so it could, it, it must have been that at least for some kids, they're going to residential schools throughout the year. They come back to be with their families, and then they're working on these sugar farms all summer. So, anyway. Fuck. Yeah, and there's there's documentation. Lex, that is that something you know about? Team. I had no idea about this yeah. at all. Um, no. Although, I will say that the idea of bonded or indentured labor is not a novel sugar industry innovation. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it doesn't entirely surprise me and i can i can sort of see those spider web tendrils of mm -hmm. how different scholars work on different parts of the labor regime connect to that but yeah that i had no idea about canadian sugar especially when i looked into it i imagined it as a as being one of two things like i was like okay what i'm gonna find is either this is a racist way to not buy brown people sugar or this is a race way to pretend you're a benevolent savior who refuses to buy brown people sugar. <laughs> um, and it, lo and behold, turns out that it's just different shades of people of color. <laughs> yes, very much so. Yeah, and I'll just also say that, like, so I think both of these stories are coming to light in the last few years, mostly because survivors are talking now, right? So with the Japanese Canadian internment, it's sort of, there are these art exhibits that have been starting to go up in memory of this sort of history. And in terms of the sort of indigenous experience, it's people that are finally feeling comfortable to actually come forward um, that experienced it at the time. But it's really terrible. Like they're working 12 to 14 hour day shifts. They're, they are either not being provided housing at all so they're like sleeping in their cars or they're being provided with like tents, basically. They also were just subject to like constant racism. One story that I was reading, there was like a person who was chased around by the locals with like bats. Just, <sighs> yeah. Because if you're already making people work for basically no money, why not also just be hor horrible to them? You know, I don't know. Anyway, so I'm not actually sure what labor conditions are like on sugar beet farms today, because when you Google it, it's this sort of historical stuff that comes up. I was able to find that most Canadian sugar refineries are unionized. So even if the, the sugar cane production, it's certainly terrible. The refining itself, it's probably fine. Like the three or four hundred employees that are working to make Canadian sugar once it already gets to the refinery. So I don't know. So what I understand from the historical point of view, I know that you feel pretty confident on a lot of the research you did, but I think some of it is conjecture because just, there's just not a lot of information, like the Rogers being connected to the internment camps. You couldn't find actual uh, facts on that? Or... I couldn't find the specific sentence on it, but there's only been like one sugar refinery in Alberta pretty much ever. And I do know that Rogers started one of the 30s. So I feel pretty confident saying that. So we are connecting the dots on that one. And then for the residential schools, that's another one where we couldn't, we're not quoting anything, but we know that residential schools were a thing in the 80s. And so were the sugar beet farms. So it's another dot that we're kind of just connecting. Yeah, I don't specifically know that these same kids are going to residential schools. I just imagine that that must have happened in at least a few cases. If anyone has any more information on that, I am actually super curious about sugar farming connected to residential schools. 
<laughs> ah, Canadian history. So <laughs> yeah, the 1980s, though, that's when it stopped. Well, the thing that gets me the most is in 1975, this Winnipeg newspaper is like, we did this investigative journalism. This is really fucked up. We need to stop. And nobody did anything for like the next decade, half decade. Um, I mean, like indigenous Canadians themselves started to collectively organize. Um, and so that's a slow process, right? But ultimately the, the practice ends up stopping, not because of something government does, not because farmers think, oh, this isn't right, but because we get farming machines and ultimately that's less trouble. <laughs> yeah, I think it reflects like the modern day dilemma with sugar though, right? Like, is it, is it a huge cop out to buy Canadian beet sugar, which is not subject to the same labor issues as cane sugar, but it is sort of taking money away from what could otherwise be helping communities around the world and yeah just being racist by pretending to be you know more moral I don't know it's interesting to me especially because this dilemma also really depends on our ideas of the racial identities of a bunch of former colonies so for example uh, a ton of sugar is produced in the Dominican Republic mm. like just oh wild amount of the land in the Dominican Republic is uh, is dedicated to cane sugar farming. And those cane sugar farms are owned by five or six Dominican families, but they are mostly staffed by, I guess, and it's not, they're not even treated well enough to say that it's staffed by, but those plantations, because I think they still basically are plantations, are worked by primarily Haitian laborers, mm. many of whom have crossed the border with little to no protection because of the poor relations between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Um, and there is a really, really strong racial element to the reason that that is divided that way. And that that is um, not least of which reason being the way international powers treated Haiti after its independence, Haitian laborers are considered black and Dominican owners of these plantations are largely considered if not white, then white adjacent, because they are often through either their own construction of their identity or through other people's construction of their identity linked more to Spanish ancestors than to uh, mixed race ancestors or to black ancestors that they share with Haitians on the island. Um, right. Yeah. And so like the question of, do I buy this cane sugar or not? Like it can be a question of, am I really taking money away from a country like Haiti or the Dominican Republic? But the answer is like, well, who are you taking that money away from? Like yeah. you are probably taking it away from the six richest families on the Dominican Republic side of the island who get a lot of, but not all of the same benefits as uh, people in spaces we don't associate with sugar like Canada and Canadian farmers may be higher up the racial hierarchy chain, but may be less wealthy than the six families who run these sugar plantations. And then when I buy cane sugar, no matter how hard I try, basically none of that money is being given to the Haitian laborers that are actually cutting it down, processing it, driving it to the processing facilities. Um, and there's no, real labor protections for those people. And so this, this question of like, what is the least racist sugar? Um, <laughs> is actually like just, imp I think it's, it's not impossible. corn syrup. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I find it functionally impossible, but obviously I find it functionally impossible because it's embedded in a bunch of colonial ideology that hasn't gone anywhere. Yeah. Really. Yeah, I suppose fair trade seems like it's kind of the best you can do. I don't know. I don't, yeah, I'm not, I don't know, because uh, I think when I look at cane sugar production, um, I also, I'm like, it's impossible to get away from the fact of what we were just talking about with unions, where it's like, of course, in my eyes, the the processing chain of sugar is constructed that way, because it, the extractive labor intensive part of the process is harvesting the natural or raw materials in a tropical climate by people of color primarily. And then in the 
you know, possibly ethnically diverse, but probably slightly more white environment in Canada, um, where the labor is unionized, that's the labor of like added value where you process this yeah. thing that was made very cheaply elsewhere in the world in a Western space and then sell it for much more than it costs you. And so I also don't find it that surprising because that is literally exactly the model of sugar consumption that was happening in the 1800s yes. when it got popular. And so sometimes this question of fair trade seems a lot to me like a certification for a change that didn't happen at all. Yeah. Although, like, to be fair to fair traders, their their whole idea is we need to be compensating the people at the point of extraction fairly, you know? And I'm sure even fair trade prices are maybe not fair. I don't know. But at least they're, well, first of all, at least they're above the legal minimum wages in those countries, which are not adequate to make a living. Um, I, I found out there's, a, there's this sustainability label called Bon Sucro, and they basically, they have some human rights elements, so they're better than not certifying. So, um, one of their rules is that you have to pay the legal minimum wage, which it just seems like that should be the floor, <laughs> not something that you specifically get a certification for. But as we know in sugar, um, there's a lot of like bonded and forced labor and exploitation of other kinds. But yeah, even with that level in places like Bolivia, the minimum wage is so low that these people still like are living in pretty extreme poverty, even if they're getting a rate that Bon Sucro considers to be a decent sort of human rights standard, I guess. I think it's also important to ask um, what role sugar is playing as a sweetener. Um, mm -hmm. I know both of you, Kyla was saying that she like reached for a spoon of honey during her challenge. And I think one of the things that has been such a successful and nefarious part of sugar's history is that it is so ubiquitous that we think of it as the obvious answer for sweetener, when historically and culturally, that's mostly not the case for a lot of people in the world. Um, and when I think of like really old fashioned foods like applesauce, like that's what it was like to eat sweet stuff if you were a person who couldn't afford sugar. And so in some places, like when I see someone selling jaggery in an Indian grocery store, that makes sense to me because that is a like less valued and less refined form of sugar. What that is, is jaggery? It's, uh, it's, I think it's kind of like the unprocessed -y bits mm. of sugar at the first stage of refining. It's a very common sweetener in Indian food, um, which makes sense because India is the first place that we know of that refined sugar. And so, um, mm. When I see people in Indian grocery stores selling jaggery, that makes sense to me. And I'm like, well, regardless of where this was produced, this like fits. But then, for example, if I go to David's Tea and they offer you the option of whether you want sugar or honey, or now there's a lot of options for do you want agave syrup? And I'm like, yeah. well, like, great. It's not sugar. But also, like, hot take maybe the monocrop industry of agave is not a great move for us to get into to get away from sugar. Like I was like, ah, uh, I think everyone likes tequila and mezcal, but also there's some problems. <laughs> and so a lot of the replacement things that people have come up with are things that if I'm not sketched out by the labor practices, I'm sketched out by some other part. <laughs> and I like, I don't like absent just starting an apiary in your backyard with your own bees. I don't like, what is the, Option, except like, unless you live in Quebec and you can tap a tree, you know. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, right? Is I'm like, I guess maple syrup is the most ethical sweetener. <laughs> like, is that even true? Or it could be things like, yeah, all there is associated with maple syrup that I know of is uh, like corrupt Quebec cartels, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and maple syrup heists. Don't forget those. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know. It, to me. The story of sugar is like everything people try and replace sugar with does things that I'm like, ah, oh, yes, you borrowed this from sugar. <laughs> <laughs> and so when it's like, ah, oh, well, we found sugar beets. Just kidding. There was also bonded labor. Yes. I'm like, well, of course there was, because if anything, this feels like the story of sweeteners at this point. And I mean, I don't really like I don't like industrial sweeteners at all. And so I don't know what the history of aspartame or stevia is, but I'm... Imagine Stevia that, was biopiracy. 
<laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm imagining it's not better. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, I didn't find anything about any of the other artificial st- sweeteners. But, um, yeah, a lot of people are starting to turn to artificial sweeteners, both for health reasons and because they're sketched out about sugar cane. Which, I mean, I don't know about any of the other artificial sweeteners, but for stevia, at least, it's not great. So it's a plant that's native to Paraguay and like a small piece of Brazil as well. There's um, a group of indigenous peoples called the Guarani. I may be mispronouncing that, but they traditionally had used it for like years and years and years to sweeten medicine, to sweeten teas, things like that. Um, And so... Basically, in the late 1800s, um, like, Western science is like, oh, hey, this is a sweetener, you know, so now we know this. <laughs> we, we're white and we can validate this knowledge now. Um, so it starts to sort of grow. Um, it actually st- started growing in India and China first because there was this whole question about whether it was carcinogenic for a while in the West. Um, and so eventually it does hit Western markets. So now... There's this sort of complicated regulatory process that happened that because there was this concern about it being a carcinogen, the stevia lobby pushed for like a product of processed stevia leaves called stevial glycosides. Hmm. So that has approval. So you can sell that in like the States and the EU, Um, but you can't buy stevia leaves because they haven't gone through this approval process because like there's no big stevia leaf lobby. So like, For indigenous smallholders, you can't sell it directly to the states or to the EU or I also assume Canada. So you have to go through these like few stevial glycoside producers who then sell it at like a huge markup. So it's become this whole problem uh, because the Guarani, first of all, the only benefit they've received so far is like the small amount of labor that they get as smallholder farmers selling these stevia leaves, which they are not paid fairly for. But secondly, these like stevial glycoside companies are now in this race to create synthetic stevial glycosides. And so soon there will be no work for the like traditional holders of this knowledge and all of the profit will be just held in these like stevia companies basically. So it sounds sounds to me, Kristen, like the solution is the next time I'm craving a sugar hit, I should reach for an apple, except that sucks because, <laughs> as you know, from our Christmas episode... Although I don't I know make... how, how apple farming works, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, shit. But I was going to say, <laughs> as you know from our Christmas episode, I make hella good cookies, uh, <laughs> and it's hard to bake <laughs> If my... they don't sit in a box for three weeks. <laughs> Shade. All right. <laughs> the crunchiest cookie I've ever eaten. <laughs> so, so like, it's it sucks because, like, one of my favorite things to do for somebody is to bake cookies. But I'll be honest, my cookie recipe is 90% sugar. It's like, it's like white sugar mixed with brown sugar with, like, a dollop of flour. And it's, like, the solution would obviously be to just stop eating sugar and have fruit instead. But that is boring and nobody's going to do it. Um, so I guess the next solution would be to um, cancel capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th- one of the things that I'm hearing, Kyla, is that like it's just impossible to replace this taste. And this is a thing that Sidney Mintz talks about a lot in his book where he's like trying to figure out wh- why why is this so popular? Like fruits are nice. They are like, nice. <laughs> why sugar? And the answer that he comes to is that it's one of the only things we eat as humans that is a t- like an elemental taste for lack of better words. So like salt, it, it salt tastes like the mineral salt, like and that's the thing that tastes like that. And all other stuff that tastes salty tastes adjacent to that mineral. And sugar is the same way where it's like all other things that taste sweet aren't sugar. They're sugary. <laughs> and so Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what you would replace sugar with if you wanted to make cookies. Because like, when I'm like, oh, just make a cookie that doesn't have sugar in it. But my answer to that is like peanut butter cookies, which obviously have sugar in them, because they're made of peanut butter. (laughs) (laughs) I guess the other thing about sugar is that makes it so good is that doesn't it? 
Weren't there studies that it lights up part of your brain that is associated with like drug use or something? Or am I making that up? I don't know. That sounds right. <laughs> it does sound right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am sure that I saw like a documentary or something. I'll look into this because, again, my research for this episode was non-existent. But I'm pretty sure that sugar is very addictive. And and historically, like you've talked about the history of sugar, but also in the recent past, I, again, I could be, maybe I'll have to cut this because maybe it's not true, but I'm pretty sure that big sugar was behind like the fat scare in the, what was it, the 90s yes, when everybody that is was true. like, I saw that. yeah, where everybody was like, oh no, fat is making us fat. And it was really just like big sugar in the background, like in the shadows, like, you know, rubbing their fingers together and being like, yes, yes, fat is the problem. But really, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> it's sugar. So, I mean, we didn't even touch on that. And I feel like that's a whole thing as well. I don't know. Like, ah, sugar, yeah. why are you so good, but so evil? This totally has historical antecedents as well, right? Because one of the things that's happened in the recent past is that people have switched from eating their calories to drinking a lot of their calories. And so many of the calories they're drinking are sugary, right? So I mean, a lot of them are now corn syrupy and not sugary, but yeah. originally most sodas had sugar in them and also Coca-Cola with cane sugar just tastes better. But a lot of this like drinking sugar, people think of it as super recent, as if it's a phenomenon that starts with soda fountains in the 50s and 60s. But realistically, drinking sugar was the cost effective, I'm not a rich person way to consume sugar for a long time, right? Like putting sugar in your tea as a pick me up, putting sugar in your coffee as a pick me up, putting sugar into hot chocolate instead of drinking hot chocolate that is unsweetened and is closer to its like original ceremonial functions. Um, all of these are ways that people are consuming sugar. And like, obviously drinking sugar cane juice didn't get popular in the West, but sugar as like a snack that you drink is not an uncommon thing historically, especially in places where sugar actually grows. And then it becomes a mainstay of Starbucks drinks and Coke and all these other beverages. And then that is, I think, where I see, oh, like, and now big sugar is like, yes, yes, fat, right. But really, the transition that allows for that is that people started drinking sugar, which is like, I don't know, at least 200 years old. Yeah. Well, and that's part of what makes it so hard to give up as well, because like I was saying, uh, for my challenge, I, I reach for sugar. Um, I'll, if I, you normally I drink water, but if I am in a really rough spot and I need energy, I'll reach for a Coca Cola or an energy drink. Um, because sugar, it tastes good. It's addictive and it gives you energy. So there's all of these amazing things that it does for your body. People were using it in the past because it's, you know, it's calorie rich. So if you don't have a lot of food, then it's a great way to, you know, store calories. I don't know. It's just, ah, like <laughs> there's a, there's a reason that it's so ubiquitous, that it's so popular and that it's so hard to give up. Yeah. I think also the things that you have both been mentioning that are replacements are things that are replacements until people got sugar. And then all of a sudden those decline in popularity. So it's like, I associate dates with Christmas. That's when my family eats dates. That's probably because we are not from a place where dates are a thing that are around all of the time. Uh, and so dates become like a seasonal treat. But if you're from a place that has dates, dates are really good until sugar is cheaper. Yeah. And then sugar does the thing that dates used to do for you. And I think that's become the case in a lot of places that have cultural and historical options for sweetener that are not sugar is once sugar and slave labor appear on the scene, sugar wins out over everything else that people have had. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, that means that the entire industry is sort of founded on this exploitational model where you really can't pay sugarcane workers well enough. Otherwise, you'd have to raise the price of sugar. I mean, I would argue we absolutely do have to do that and sugar can be more expensive. <laughs> but like, the reality is that it would make sugar more expensive. And the industry doesn't want that. I think it's also the case that historically, 
once it becomes part of the working class diet as a calorie, like pick me up or a calorie substitute, it enters the working class diet as more affordable than whatever the alternatives were. And that means that we've got 200 or more years of uphill battle against the idea that the reason sugar is good is because it's cheap. Um, When sugar was a delicacy, maybe that wasn't the case. But when sugar was a delicacy, it also wasn't in everyone's diet. It was in people's diet where it grew and people's diet who could afford it far away from where it grew. And so we've got 200 years of an uphill battle where if people thought about the labor practices at all, they thought about it as beneficial to them being able to do the labor they were doing. Sugar is like impossibly embedded in exploitative labor structures because not paying the people who grew and harvested sugar is what allowed factory owners to barely pay the people who worked in a factory. And so everyone involved in that consumption chain is dependent on not paying somebody who works at some rung on the ladder below them. Yeah. And this is, I think this is the case as far as I am aware of across the story of sugar is that once it starts being processed for export, it's about not paying people for the pick me up. Yeah. And ultimately like automation and sugar beets is kind of about that too. You know, I mean, there isn't that sort of straightforward explanation exploitation because you don't have to pay robots but that's still a set of workers that now aren't being supportive so it's kind of a tricky question too you know yeah and i think there are a lot of scholars now who are working on the way that technologies of control crossed different colonial spaces so the passport maybe it gets invented in one place but it becomes a vehicle for keeping people who don't look like you out of this place that you've colonized yeah or You know, that's the case with a lot of different migration things. But one of the things people don't talk a lot about that is the center of my research now is the institution of the contract. And for the sugar industry in particular, contract labor and contracts signed by indentured workers are the signaling mechanism for this is not slavery. And the difference between sugar as farmed by indentured laborers and sugar as farmed by slaves is the contract. But the realities on the ground for the people that I study are sometimes there are no differences. Like sometimes those differences are non-existent. They're sharing field space with people who were recently enslaved or they're sharing field space with people for whom this has been made the only option for them to work. And the signaling mechanism for consumers to believe that they're on the good side is, but look, everyone who farmed your sugar said they wanted to. They all consented. And so the institution of the contract, I think especially in spaces like Canada, and this goes back to our talking about the unionization of the Red Path factory, is like the institution of the contract is how I would know if something was fair. It's like, oh, I'm paying them the amount I promised I would. But so few occasions are we asking, like, is that amount of pay and a amount of pay that is reasonable, yes. not just what we promised we would pay. Yeah, and how equal was the bargaining table, you know? Yeah. yeah. And in the case of sugar, the bargaining table has almost never been equal. Uh, indentured laborers were often running away from uh, different social issues on the subcontinent in India, or they were attempting to form a new community because they found the one they were in to be oppressive or they were leaving because they wanted to improve their family's conditions at home and they were going to send remittances. Um, and that is still the case with a lot of workers, especially in the Dominican Republic, for example. But the bargaining was often done where you signed your indenture contract in the port in India. You don't know anything about the person you're about mm-hmm. to go work for. And so now the complaints that I'm reading are like they're devastating. There is one complaint where uh, a woman, it's like five lines long, and she basically says, I'm sick. The manager told me I have to go out to the field anyway. I can't because I'm sick. Also, I have an infant baby that if I go out to the field, will be alone in the barracks. Oh or God. the other complaints are things like, I told the manager I was sick. He locked me in a windowless room with all the other laborers who are sick. When I told him I was sick today, he said, go to the police camp. I ran away to complain instead. (laughs) And so 
this wow. like question of unequal bargaining terms is not even just about when you said you would do the labor. It's also about what the labor is like in the middle of harvesting sugar. Like sugar cane has to be processed super close to the point at which you cut the plant down. Yes. Because the chemistry of the plant changes the longer it's not attached to its roots and eating nutrients. Yes. And so that means that it is a really labor intensive practice. It's a very time sensitive practice. And this becomes tied to the institution of the contract where one of the central contentions is, are we going to pay laborers for task work, do this many things and you get this much pay? Or are we going to pay them wage work, work for this long and you get this much pay? Yeah. Yeah. And especially for something so seasonal, it's probably not fair to pay what would be the equivalent of an hourly wage if you're working that like 35, 40 hours a week all year, because it's really just during the harvest that they're able to work, at least in this practice, you know? Yeah. And that becomes a central question really early on in the practice of harvesting sugar. Uh, you know, slavery is abolished in the 1830s in the British Empire and indenture contracts are starting to be signed in the 1830s in the British Empire. And that question is immediately on the minds of planters and administrators and workers, because one of the central contestations is workers saying, my contract says this, but I'm not being paid this much. Or, you know, they're arbitrarily shifting the goalposts on the plantation about what constitutes a fair amount of task for the amount that people are being paid. Um, and I don't think those questions have gone away. I just think that we're not familiar with the story of the technology of exploitation. We're familiar with the story of exploitation and we're familiar with this teleological narrative that says things are less exploitative now, yeah. but we're not really familiar with what technologies of governance or technologies of control have allowed exploitation to prosper. And by only questioning things like, should I eat sugar? Should I eat sugar from this country? It means that we sometimes drop the ball on things like, should those people have signed that contract? Is yeah. my eating sugar supporting an institution? Yeah. And I will also say that what I read about modern slavery in the sugar industry, it actually sounds quite similar to indentured servitude. I was reading a sort of a report that looks at modern slavery in Brazilian sugarcane. And essentially what ends up happening is they'll recruit from within like the favelas. Um, and in some cases also sort of rural villages that are quite poor, but oftentimes it'll be sort of from the slums and they'll, they'll pay up front. So you get a small amount of pocket money. And then there's sort of the promise of good work and good wages. And people get driven out into like remote Brazil where they're out of sight, out of mind for most people. And then they're told, like, you're in debt because of the, the cost of the food and the transport and to get you here, and sometimes also the tools to extract the sugar cane. And then people sort of end up getting stuck in this situation where they have never really actually consented to work in the conditions that they're in, but they now have, like, this indebtedness, um, and they're often sort of illiterate, not able to sort of understand their own rights or to sort of articulate them and also like they're so far away that they don't have recourse anyway so i think this is one of the reasons that i was really drawn to the study of indentured labor in particular and it so happens that indentured labor is attached to the story of sugar but one of the things that i have found is uh i took a class in my last year at u of t I think it's still being taught. It was in the diaspora studies department and it was just called modern slavery. Mm. Immensely depressing. But one of the things that we talked about is, you know, what makes this slavery? And there's a huge reluctance to use the word slavery now because people rightfully are concerned that calling things slavery in a contemporary context diminishes how much attention we pay and how much compassion we have for enslaved peoples who suffered under American chattel slavery, for example. Uh, and that's, especially in the North American context, that is what people think of as slavery, is the enslavement of people from primarily West Africa being imported to the Americas and the Caribbean. And that's absolutely fair. It's supposed to be paid attention to. Yes. But it means that people aren't looking at a broader swath of institutions of bondage 
or enslavement across other geographic spaces because they're afraid that doing that means that we have to not pay attention to American chattel slavery. And I, I think part of what I'm attempting to do with the work that I'm hoping to publish eventually is that I, I want to connect those different strands of indebted. I think that those different strands of indebtedness are attached to each other. Like indenture, Indian indenture only exists because people wanted to fill a gap created by the absence of slavery or the abolition of chattel slavery in the Americas. It is, however, not a brand new institution. And I actually am hoping to study Indian indenture in the Indian Ocean arena, primarily because the Caribbean story is really caught up with the story of American chattel slavery. But the story of indenture in the Indian Ocean arena is about the modification of different forms of debt bondage and slavery that already existed where there was seasonal labor migration between South India and Sri Lanka, or there were people who would go from India to Southeast Asia and they would work in Malaya and then come back to, to mostly South India, but also other parts. Or it's also the story of tea because there are people doing circular migration and involved in certain forms of debt bondage in Assam who are harvesting tea. In fact, that story is mostly about women who are believed to be better at it because their hands are small and they'll be gentle with tea leaves. And so (laughs) all of these labor institutions are connected. Yeah. And I don't think that it's impossible to recognize how bad one or another of these institutions is without also saying there were parts of other institutions of bondage that were worse. Like the situation of women in the United States who were enslaved is not the same in all cases, but it's also similar enough that I think there should be a solidarity building project where people are like, okay, here's what enslavement looked like here. Here's what enslavement looked like in this other space here. Now we have a list of ways that enslavement looked Maybe we could get rid of modern enslavement. And you can't do that if you're not taking an inventory of all the different ways that people have been coerced into labor. So I think I, you know, like, I think there's modern slavery in the sugar industry, but where that belongs on a spectrum of coerced to uncoerced labor, we're really bad at identifying. Yeah. And it's also just, it's tough to know because a lot of these plantations are sort of removed from the public eye and it's hard for journalists to really come in and researchers, you know, for sure. Um, my favorite is like a gross word, I guess, but like the documentary that really enlightened me about what this looks like now is, I think it's called the price of sweetness. You can, you can definitely rent it on YouTube. I know that for sure. And that is like a journalist managed to get documentary footage of what these plantations are like in the Dominican Republic. And to be honest, they don't look that different from what I am visualizing when I read the complaints of the individuals whose stories I'm writing about now. Yeah. And that was, um, that was my impression from sort of my brief research is these conditions, they seem out of time in like maybe (laughs) the incredibly naive narrative that we tell about the 21st century, you know? Yeah. I think You know, there's probably something to be said about if we're studying the institution, if I'm studying the institution of (laughs) the contract, what does fair labor or fair trade standard contracts, what part of the story does that tell? Because that is supposed to be a change. But, you know, if you're playing good historian and you're looking at change over time, like (laughs) indenture was also supposed to be a change and it was considered extremely humane. Really? Except that they lived in the same barracks that enslaved people had lived in, and they were transported on the same boats in many cases, and they were working sometimes side by side with enslaved people because indenture starts before slavery is abolished in a lot of places. Um, But yeah, it's considered this humane, progressive alternative. We won't enslave people. They'll sign contracts. (laughs) They're free, as you can see, since they signed on the line. Yeah, and if if your options are take this indentured servitude for almost no money or starve to death, that's not really a choice. You know what I mean? For sure. And that is also like another whole piece of the story is it, it is so hard. It's what I'm really interested in, but it's so hard. Why did people who signed these contracts choose to go? Yeah. Particularly as indenture is ending. Indenture lasts roughly 
from the 1830s to the 1920s. And so, for example, the people who I am uh, researching and writing about right now are filing these complaints between 1913 and 1916. At this point, dozens, if not hundreds of people from your village have gone into indenture and possibly come back because indenture was often we can root it in specific villages. We're like, oh, this village, almost everyone left. Um, but that means that, like, if people are coming back, they're telling you what it's like. Like, some of them, sure, maybe somebody comes home and lies and they get a bonus from an overseer and then they've recruited you and they get, like, a commission, which makes commission sound really sketchy and that makes me sad. But, you know, some people are coming back and telling you the truth and people are signing up anyway. Yeah. And so the question of, like, what is life like that you would sign this contract knowing what you're walking into is a huge question for me and for my research. Um, because towards the end of indenture, it's not just like an adventure story where you like sail off to a new land. And that story is itself inaccurate because there were lots of social taboos, lots of dangers, lots of prohibitions against leaving to go do this kind of work that operated alongside a history of mobile labor and of seasonal labor. And so it's less and less simple, this story of like, when is someone coerced? Yeah. When is someone free? And something that uh, you said, Kristen, that I that really made me think was you were like, well, like, in so many cases, like, they're not literate, how could they be reading the contract? Yeah. And that's the case in the period that I study too. But one of the things that I'm trying to consider is like, okay, if you're not literate, what are the other savvy strategies you use? Because nobody wants to sign up yes. for something bad. <laughs> and so like, what are these workers doing? And one of the things that I think I'm discovering is rumors play a huge mm. part in determining what you do or don't think you're knowledgeably signing up for. And like when people triage and make the decision to work for this pittance of money in a country they've never been to, a lot of it is because, okay, word of mouth has gotten back to me that this is like this on this plantation, that I should sign a contract to work on this plantation, not this other one. And it means that the workers are able to develop some kinds of savvy strategies to negotiate about their pay. Like some of the workers in the period that I'm studying, the planters are complaining that the workers know that there's a labor shortage and that they're demanding more wages. And so while I think the broader institution of indenture is just this awful story of exploitation, there's also these moments that provide some kind of a roadmap for giving workers credit and asking them in the modern context, like, what is it actually like? And as a result, what would be fair to you? Yeah. I don't know. It's This whole topic is so fraught, I feel. <laughs> what an uplifting episode this will be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i would yeah someone's gonna be listening to this episode and eating something sweet and then just like wretch <laughs> <laughs> i mean but yeah like we've said there's just no getting around it um there's no solution for this episode other than stop eating sugar but like who's gonna do that <laughs> it's not even like we can like stop eating sugar isn't even the solution because if we do that then like you were saying, then we're not supporting maybe communities that rely on the sugar industry. So, you know, just cutting it out isn't even the most ethical choice, except that if we are supporting those communities, it's we're supporting the rich sugar barons. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the story of sugar is definitely the story that we've all been much more connected to each other for longer than we want to admit. And that that connection has consequences when someone works to put stuff in your kitchen or on your table, you are partly responsible for what happens to them in order for them to do that for you. This is something that like, it's so, we're so surrounded by sugar and we just, nobody wants to look at how problematic it is. So I think this is one of our biggest blind spots, I don't know, as a culture, because it's just so broken and we're so deep in it. I, it's really hard to look at. Because there's not a lot that, as an individual, there's it's hard to know what a solution is. Yeah, that's true. I I, I remember thinking that when, um, Lex, you were talking about how the focus on, you know, should we do beet sugar, cane sugar, it punts the question of, you know, are these institutions unfair or not? But I think that's also partially because 
we feel a profound lack of power as like people just living in the world, you know? So I suppose, I mean, yeah, one solution, support fair trade, that's probably on the margins a good thing to do. But I guess being politically active is really the only way to to actually sort of push the needle on this kind of an issue, I guess. Yeah, I think for those of us who don't live in the places where sugar is grown and live instead in places that eat a lot of it or where it's refined, in terms of sugar, the political obligations or necessities are like, you actually have to care about people who are not anywhere near you. Mm -hmm. Like you have to care a lot about people in South Africa or in the Caribbean or in India or in Indonesia. Like you have to care about people in those spaces if you care about sugar, because like sugar just isn't proximate. There's no, there's no seeing what sugar looks like when it's not inside your food. And there's no seeing the sugar in your food when you live here. One of the things I think about a lot is The province where most indentured laborers worked in the period that I study in South Africa is Natal. And when you land at the airport in Durban, it's maybe a 20 or 30 minute drive from the city center. And Durban is sort of the capital city of where indentured laborers eventually ended up in that period. And on the drive from the airport into the Durban city center, you just pass like 20 minutes worth of sugarcane fields. And I remember being in the car and like looking around at these fields when I was in South Africa. And I was like, it's really dark. Like it, it looks like a forest. Like the plants are much taller than I thought they would be. They were much closer together than I thought they would be. And I remember thinking like, wow, if someone is working in there, I cannot see them right now. I I think that's emblematic of what it is actually like to think about people in this industry is like, you can't see sugar in your food, you can't see sugar in your Subway sandwich, and you can't see workers who are far away from you, but even the people next to them might not be seeing them as often as they need to be seen. And that, that significantly impacts your ability to motivate is like the further and the more invisible this thing is, the harder that is for people to talk about. And so it requires you to like think very carefully about whether you're going to put an extra spoon of sugar in something. And it requires you to like tell everyone uncomfortable things about sugar and ruin Christmas dinner. (laughs) And so, you know, like I am probably going to go home after recording this episode and I will almost certainly do Christmas shopping and then bake. And the thing that I'm going to bake is like this cake that my family really likes uh, that is from Trinidad. And like it is functionally a loaf cake and that loaf cake has Like, it has flour and stuff in it, but it has raisins and, like, candied fruit and coconut and sugar. And I would love it if the, like, candied fruit, if I knew anything about where it came from, but, like, (laughs) it's candied in sugar. And I will probably go home and make that, and then my family will be eating it, and they're like, wow, this is amazing. And I'll be like, and also depressing. Did you know (laughs) that? Um and yeah, I think that's that's the sort of like, that's my best guess at what we can do right yeah. now is just like uncomfortably remind everyone all the time. Because I tried, I tried a similar thing to what you tried, Kyla, when I first discovered this problem with sugar. And I was like, I'm just going to not eat it anymore. And then like, <laughs> I hated my like, very poorly processed chain coffee that was clearly burnt <laughs> because sugar and fat are what makes bad coffee taste better. <laughs> and then I like couldn't eat any of my like snack granola bar things because sugar is what sticks it together. Yeah. <laughs> and then I like couldn't eat my breakfast cereal because it turns out I like the one that has the almonds and the clusters in it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. I'll just be hungry then. That's fine. <laughs> And I thought I was going to get away with it at dinner. And then there was sugar in the creamed corn. And there was like, you can't. We all like it. There is like a genetic preference for eating this thing. If it's inevitable, you have to make the conversation about it inevitable. So I think so that we're ending this episode on a maybe sort of positive note. What I think <laughs> what I think we should do, Kristen and I, is maybe research some – if there's any sort of – foundation that you can donate to or activist group that you can become involved in maybe we'll we'll see if there's anything out there that that is good to to share and we'll share that when this episode comes out as maybe if you're feeling overwhelmed and powerless 
something that you can do. I don't know. What do you think, Kristen? Yeah, I mean, I think even um, Human Rights Watch does some investigations around like sugar and labor practices. I like them. But you had a call to action as well. Hopefully a really good one that solves all of our problems. I was just going to make a joke that people should tell all their friends to listen to this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Our call to action is make your friends sad about sugar so that they can sit uncomfortably while they eat delicious cookies. Cool. I just like (laughs) gift everyone a tin of cookies, but also gift them sweetness and power. (laughs) Like, you know, everyone's profoundly uncomfortable and then has this like tin of cookies to comfort eat while reading this depressing 1980s history that changed multiple fields of scholarship. It's Oh my goodness. I love it. So yeah, I think this episode, it's going to come out just before Valentine's Day. (laughs) So what is a more perfect Valentine's Day gift than sweetness and power? And this episode. (laughs) Definitely download it for your friends and and listen to it on your date. (laughs) So awkward. (laughs) All of my scholarship is, like, not good fodder for dates. <laughs> like, have you heard about slavery? <laughs> and, yeah, it's not not fun. <laughs> Lex, speaking of your research, is there is there anything that you want to plug since you're sitting on a podcast right now? Is there anywhere people can find you or, or find out more about what you do? Oh, whoa, I've never been... Oh, that's so cool. I've never been asked this question. I'm a scholar now. <laughs> um, I... Where can people cite you? <laughs> I am, you know, I'm working on researching the project that I described, and if it turns out to be well-formed, then eventually it'll be able to, like, edit the links <laughs> to this journal article if it turns into one of those. But if not, um, I am on Twitter as, I think, at Lex Sundersing, um, and <laughs> This my is Twitter how little is- she promotes herself. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is like a bad, this is a bad moment where I discover that I don't actually understand self-promotion. Um, yeah, I'm on Twitter as at Lex Sundersing. Not all of my tweets are about sugar. Some of them are just about movies that I'm watching. Perfect. Um, <laughs> some of those movies are depressing, but some of them are uplifting. And then um, I don't have any like scholarly publications to plug at the moment, but I would tell people that if you are interested in this kind of topic in an altruistic plug for my alma mater, uh, the University of Toronto has a really good and developing program in uh, food history and in food studies. And it is especially pertinent that it is primarily located on the Scarborough campus. You don't have to be married to the downtown campus to find cool stuff at University of Toronto. And then other than that, it's just like, secretly, the story of food is the story of labor. So I would plug you know, gift your friends a labor history, gift your friends a (laughs) union membership supporting thing (laughs) for Valentine's Day for Christmas. Take your partner to a unionization protest. (laughs) Don't cross picket lines. Yeah, don't cross picket lines. (laughs) Buy people copies of Sweetness and Power. (laughs) Follow my Twitter for sad tweets about labor and food. Amazing. We will do all of those things and we will share any future stuff that you come up with because it sounds like it's going to be fascinating as well as deeply upsetting, which is what this podcast really aims for, I think. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, so Lex, do you have like anyone that you want to call out specifically, like a really supportive best friend or family member? Oh, man. I mean, the the story of my research is the story of my family feeding me so that I don't have to stop researching. Um, So shout out to my family for making all of the knowledge that I then gifted you (laughs) possible. Um, I think, yeah, they're, they're the ones who made the episode possible at my end. Amazing. So I guess we'll end it here. Thank you for joining us, Lex. And Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. And uh, hopefully we get to have you back because I feel like you have a lot of really interesting things to say. So we'll do another one of these maybe with you if we have, uh, if we have another topic that comes up. Sounds good. <laughs>